Hello, it is 1DM here. It has been a while since I've made a video between my class schedule and gigs and just taking care of myself. But today I want to talk about representation of disabilities and disabled people in tabletop role-playing games and specifically in Pathfinder 2E. This is related to the publishing of Lost Omens The Grand Bazaar, which is three months ago now, uh, which includes eight whole pages dedicated to a store full of items made for disabled adventurers. I will be going through these items and talking a little bit about what they do for the game. But for that, I'm going to talk about the larger question of how to represent disabled persons in fantasy. I do want to start just by saying that I am an able-bodied person. I'm not an expert on the topics I'm talking about. So I hope I don't come off like I think I'm an expert. Uh, but this is an important topic, and I think it's worth talking about, even if I'm not the perfect person to do it. Uh, if I do make mistakes, please tell me I'd like to know. But with that, I want to go and dive into the question of what exactly does it look like to accurately and respectfully represent disability in fantasy? I'm sure you're aware that historically it has been done very little. If you think of like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or The Wheel of Time or whatever books or movies or comics, fantasy stories often have just not represented disabled people at all. Uh, I'm referring to fantasy today as I move into Pathfinder, but it's also a problem of sci-fi or even realistic fiction. I also want to be clear that not every story has to answer this question per se, but it's still a problem how woefully underrepresented many groups of people are. So one issue I've seen raised is the topic of capability rendering right here. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I couldn't find the exact comment I read a while back that mentioned this, but I, I recall reading a Reddit comment on someone saying basically that they, they couldn't imagine what it would look like for a warrior in a wheelchair to wheel up to an enemy and swing their great axe. Wouldn't they get immediately attacked back? You know, they lack all their mobility for dodging and they'd need a hand to move. Like, just what does that even look like? And their basic point was that a role-playing game is about visualizing a scenario based on its description. And if the situation comes up that they can't visualize, that'll break the game. It ruins my immersion. Uh, and a common retort to this line of thinking is that there are already so many parts of the game that aren't real. Just use your imagination harder and let it happen. Uh, it's, it's just a game. And this has some truth to it, uh, but it also doesn't really address the question the first user raised. What do I do if I can't visualize it? And he sort of has a point, you know, if I can visualize a dragon breathing fire or a wizard casting a spell, because I've seen that stuff in movies, but I haven't seen a wheelchair user swing a great axe. I don't know what that looks like. Uh, so if visualization is paramount to the game, then sure, it might not work to have wheelchair using melee fighters. But we should ask ourselves why visualization is essential. Is that more important than a player having fun if they want to play a character in a wheelchair? If the player also uses a wheelchair, what are we telling them when we say their character can't do the same? So these are some interesting questions raised. Uh, one thing that can help resolve it is having media that helps us visualize. If there were a high fantasy movie featuring a wheelchair using Great X Wielder, and they made the visuals convincing, I'm sure it would be a lot easier for us to visualize that in a tabletop game. Uh, so that's one thing that could change to help answer this question. But if we go back to the idea of capability rendering, we see that there are still limits to this. You know, let's try to imagine, say, a quadriplegic person. Realistically, a quadriplegic person in a melee fight to the death will die. That's, that's what happens if you can't move and your enemy has a sword. Uh, we can ask the same question about a quadriplegic adventurer. Why is visualization essential? Is it more important than a player having fun? And if the player is quadriplegic, what are we telling them by disallowing quadriplegic adventures? These are the same questions as earlier. Now they're even harder to answer because a quadriplegic adventure getting in fights is even weirder to imagine. Like, how would that work? How could you possibly represent that accurately and respectfully? Uh, so this gets to the next big point, which is at the heart of representing disabled persons and RPGs is a tension between a representation that is accurate or respectful and a representation that is fun for the player and balanced for the game. And at least as, as I understand it, two people with similar disabilities might disagree on how to do it. You know, there's a desire to have the game accurately represent that their life has hardships or differences. And at the same time, there's a desire to not mechanically punish the players for playing disabled characters. 
and one resolution is to show hardship outside of combat uh, and empower characters to act like any other characters in fights. This option is especially relevant in Pathfinder, where combat balance is tightly controlled. It's not the only option, but it is a prevalent one. Uh, so I want to talk more at this point about um, options presented in the Grand Bazaar. Uh, but keep in mind this possible tension between accuracy and fun or balance. Uh, I want to keep referring to that as I, as I go through this. So these items are in a shop in the Grand Bazaar called Morin's Mobility Apparel, though they have assistive devices for more than just movement. Uh, the first page covers the shop owner, an elf named Morin with a prosthetic arm and leg. He's a cool character, uh, but I'll skip to the items. The assistive items start off with canes and crutches. These are very simple items. They require one hand to use, and they help support or probe for blind or partially sighted people. All of these double as clubs, with a couple added traits for griffin or probing canes. Their uses as assistive devices are not really given mechanics, just as a character with a limp or impaired vision doesn't have any strict mechanics published. I think these are cool items because they do make a character notably different to visualize or fight with. They do have a significant cost of needing a hand. That is a huge cost for a caster who wants hands free for wands, staves, shields, and consumables. Though it's easier to visualize a wizard with a cane, it actually is mechanically easier to play a fighter with a cane, as their cane hand can double as their weapon hand. So that's sort of an interesting quirk of this, of this way that's been ruled. And if we think again about the tension between accuracy and balance, this is one place where accuracy has sort of taken precedent. And some characters' abilities in a fight will be negatively impacted by this need. At the same time, it won't break a character, uh, and we could homebrew to further reduce the impact. Uh, I might homebrew an ability to double a cane as a staff to make casters easier, um, but it's not written in here as an option. Uh, next up are hearing aids. Basic hearing aids can just be taken or taken out or put back in as one action. Magical hearing aids are functionally identical. The action just turns them off instead of removing them. Uh, enhanced hearing aids can actually improve your hearing. Uh, these are pretty simple items. They don't punish a character using them whatsoever. Uh, and they can actually help by turning them off when a character would save against an auditory effect. Um, nothing bad to say about these. Representation seems both accurate and mechanically balanced. Uh, there's a nice sidebar here uh, about waiving the cost, the gold cost, for characters who have had their assistive devices for a long time. Again, this just reinforces that needing assistive devices should not punish characters. Cool. Uh, the next items are joint supports, just called splints and supports. These items actually have no mechanical effect whatsoever. They basically say that they reduce aches and pains and support mobility but you can still move regularly without one. If you make a character that needs one of these, the onus is on the player to roleplay that feature as it won't mechanically affect them in any way. Uh, this is that resolution that involves making a character's visualization different without making it worse in any way, which is one solid method of representation. <clears throat> uh, there's another great sidebar here about how to handle more specific cases of characters' impairments hurting their ability to participate in a game. It really just advises to default to allowing them to participate, which of course is, is the underlying idea that Paizo is, is coming in here with. Um, these items exist because the designers want all characters to be able to participate. So this is not a, a totally new idea, but great to reinforce. Uh, there's a single item here for a prosthetic limb or body part. This again has virtually no change to a character's mechanics, uh, but it does very much change how you visualize them. The prosthetic also, notably, it doesn't list any hit points or hardness, so it isn't treated as an item that could be damaged. It's just a part of your body. Uh, this is also a fun item because you can have whatever design you like, which could actually enable some really unique and badass-looking characters, so that's, that's pretty cool. The next item here is especially interesting, uh, not so much as the item as the characters it's for. This is a reading ring used to read text by running the finger over the text. It lets blind characters read like anyone else, not needing braille or a um, reader for them. The greater version of this uh, actually seems really nuts to me. Uh, the wearer can just read any language. That, that seems like a must-have for a party, nearly. Um, 
Uh, but to the actual point, for blind characters, this is really cool. It makes perfect sense in the setting as a magic item. You might notice that this item doesn't make a huge impact on a blind character's ability to fight. And this is one thing I am not super excited about because blind characters, at least rules as written, really aren't mechanically viable at the moment. Yeah, in the core rulebook, there's this sidebar about uh, permanent disability, suggesting that a blind character, rather than just having the blinded condition, can't detect enemies using vision, they crit fail visual perception checks, they're immune to blinded or dazzled, and they might have blind fight for free. But even giving blind fight doesn't make them good in a fight. Without seeing, all enemies will be considered hidden when using an imprecise scent like hearing, and the character will have a 20% mischance on any attack they ever make, or, tar or, or any targeted spell. The only exceptions would be area of effect abilities, and building a character who only uses area of effect abilities isn't much of an option. As far as I know, there isn't a way for a character to gain another precise scent to combat this effect. There are some good ways to homebrew it, but playing by the published rules, blind characters are going to struggle a lot. I would think this is this is probably more true to the experience of being blind, but it has some downsides. Um, so I think that's a really interesting choice on Paizo's, Paizo's part. Uh, there's another item here called basic corrective lenses, also known as glasses, uh, for characters with impaired vision. This is something that some characters probably already used just without an official item for it. Not a huge deal. And here we get to a very big section on wheelchairs. This is the example I used earlier when talking about capability rendered. This is an especially interesting section because there are quite a few mechanics for wheelchairs. They're not just an item you slap on a character and never think about. There's notes about an interact action to strap in. There's bulk, frames, transformation magic, how movement works, uh, how the prone condition works. And the summary is that nothing is, is mechanically that different. You have the same bulk limit, you can polymorph with your chair, your speed is determined the same way, and riding the chair is like standing for prone. Notably, although you use your hands to propel the wheels, you can do it with other things in your hands, so wheelchair users are not required to always have hands free. Uh, onto the chairs themselves, you have a standard chair and then a traveler's chair, which seems like what a player character should have for adventuring. It allows movement on stairs and uneven ground. Uh, there are two magical chairs that grant a skill bonus and a uh, extra action. They're just like any magic item, but they're combined with a wheelchair. And there are some chair upgrades too. You can take it underwater. You can add storage to it, but it doesn't stack with a backpack. It's, it's basically the same thing. And the most exciting option to me is impulse control, which lets a character move the chair's wheels with their mind instead of with their hands. This really is what makes the character visualizable to me. If the character no longer needs their hands on the wheels, I can totally imagine wheeling up to an enemy, swinging a great ax. That makes perfect sense. As a GM, if a player wanted to play a character in a wheelchair, I would probably just give them this add-on for free, uh, in addition to having the chair for free, just because it makes the visualization easier without changing much mechanically. That is just me though. I, I, love to hear other opinions on what you do. Uh, and the last add-ons are three mutually exclusive add-ons that add a simple weapon attack to the chair. Uh, metal rims, wheel blades, or spikes. Uh, they're all identical except for their damage type and weapon group. These weapons are actually weirdly really strong because while they're only a d4 damage die and agile, they don't require hands. I wouldn't quite call them overpowered because a martial character really should still have a higher damage weapon in their actual hand. But free hand weapons are exceedingly rare, uh, so these have some real uses actually. At this point, there's a really sort of hilarious wheelchair, wheel, wheelchair alternative called a leg chair, a living animal in the shape of a chair that can be taken as an animal companion. Uh, I love this note here that uh, Despite some desperate attempts from magic users, this is the only name that has stuck. <laughs> uh, and mechanically speaking, it's actually a really good animal companion. It has the same starting stats as a bear companion, but a bit higher speed. It's a fantastic mount with its 40 foot movement speed. Its support action grants the rider plus one AC, 
its advanced maneuver gets it out of tricky spaces. Uh, and it's a funny image, but I also, I would absolutely play a character using one. It seems like a lot of fun. Um, and, and after that, there's a special companion item just for the leg chair uh, with some damage actions. Nothing super, super relevant to, to this video. Um, and that's the end of the wheelchair section. Uh, let's, let's talk about this a bit. I am really pleased with what they've done with wheelchairs. It seems, from my perspective, like a good representation that includes wheelchair users and adventures. They seem to have taken the route of enabling wheelchair users to be mechanically almost identical uh, with anyone else in a fight. The one thing I'm confused about is, if that's the route they took for wheelchairs, why not for blind characters? Why do blind characters have to struggle so much? I, I don't know if that contrast was intentional or just a side effect of the design process, um, but I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, so, okay, let's go to the last couple things. Uh, there are a couple more specific magical items used as prosthetics. There are also versions that go over a limb to be used by any character. Uh, so they're not exclusive to disabled characters. Uh, these are some cool magic items, but again, they're not directly relevant for enabling adventures. Uh, and that's actually the end of the shop. So I want to go back to this tension I mentioned at the beginning, the tension between accurate representation and mechanical balance. And it seems like, for the most part, Paizo has leaned into the mechanical balance side, which, which makes a lot of sense with such a tightly balanced game. People love to use the phrase uh, tight math. The math is very tight in this game. Uh, but they haven't, for the most part, tried to diminish or ignore any differences or disabilities, just enable those characters. Some characters with disabilities will mechanically act like anyone else, but even in those cases, there's some really good flavor and different visuals that go with them. Uh, but Paizo also, Paizo also hasn't tried to account for everything. Uh, and they've acknowledged this in the sidebar. They can't account for every experience of disability. Uh, and again, I mentioned the example of a quadriplegic character. They haven't added items to help those characters, uh, which is understandable. That's a, a really difficult thing to do in a way that's both accurate and fun. Paizo also hasn't gone into really anything related to mental disabilities. Uh, they mentioned that down here. Those are another topic that's uniquely hard to mechanize into a game without it being disrespectful. Uh, and they've acknowledged that as well in this core rulebook sidebar. They said that if you're going to play a character with a mental illness, it's on you to roleplay that, but be careful about its impact, which, which makes a lot of sense. I, I pretty much agree with that portrayal. So, as a takeaway, there is still more to do. The task of representation is never really finished, and there are still some areas I'm, I'm not sure about, like I mentioned with blind characters. But for the most part, Paizo has done a really good job here. Just in publishing official content for this, they're doing much better than any other games have done. Uh, but the content is high quality as well. Uh, in general, I'm very happy with the items they've made here. Uh, I'd love to hear more opinions on this, uh, especially from anyone who knows more about this topic than me. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Um, if you like this video, you know, like and subscribe, blah, blah, blah. I have a Patreon, whatever. Um, more than any of that, I would I would genuinely appreciate some comments. I'm... I, really making this video to start a discussion more than anything else. So please go do that. I'll see you down in the comments and have a great day.